The series for the next four weeks is on 2nd and 3rd John. 2nd and 3rd John. These are two letters which are oftentimes overlooked. Um, That's why we've named it Overlooked Letters. It's also two letters that even if we read them, we would probably skim over them real quick and we would just pass on to the next thing because you got to hurry up and check your Instagram or something like that. So we don't spend a lot of time on these two letters. And so I thought this would be a really good thing for us to do is to look at these two letters and to see what the Lord has for us. Today, what we're going to see in in 2 John verses 1 through 7 um, is we're going to learn about the Apostle John's teaching that walking in the truth of the gospel by loving one another in obedience to Jesus is his priority. It's his concern for the churches. So his concern in writing these two letters are that we are walking in the truth of the gospel by loving one another in obedience to Jesus. And so that's where we're going to be heading. So let's look at this in 2 John verses 1 through 7. Here's what the Apostle John writes. The elder to the elect lady and her children whom I love in the truth, and not only I, but also all who know the truth, because of the truth that abides in us and will be with us forever. Grace, mercy, and peace will be with us from God the Father and from Jesus Christ, the Father's Son, in truth and love. I rejoice greatly to find some of your children walking in the truth, just as you were commanded by the Father. And now I ask you, dear lady, not as though I were writing you a new commandment, but the one we have had from the beginning, That we love one another. And this is love. That we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment just as you have heard from the beginning. So that you should walk in it. For many deceivers have gone out into the world. Those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh, flesh. Such a one is the deceiver and the antichrist. So, Father, we ask for your wisdom. We ask, God, that as we come to your word and we are seeking to understand it appropriately and rightly, that you would grant us all that we need. God, you tell us that the Holy Spirit, which abides in us, who repent and believe in the gospel, will lead us into all truth, that we, by the Holy Spirit, are granted the very mind of Christ to plumb the depths of who you are. And so, God, would you grant us in abundance overflowingly so grant us the presence of the holy spirit in and amongst us that we may understand and behold wondrous truths in your word and god we ask these things in jesus name amen when anytime you begin a new new series or you are beginning to read a new book or a letter in the bible you always want to start with some background information and so that's where i'm going to start Um, I am not going to give you a whole host of information because I don't want to do that. And let's be honest, you don't want me to do that. And uh, this is less of a lecture, more of a sermon. And so I'm just going to give a little uh, teasing of some background things. And if you want more information on anything, please uh, contact us, email us, call us, whatever. And we'll get you pointed in the right direction where you can do some more study together. But if you look in your Bibles, hopefully you have um, a good edition of the Bible where you have the letters of 2nd and 3rd John right next to each other. And so as I say things about 2nd and 3rd John, you can just, you can look at them both at once and it's just amazing. And so uh, make sure you have that open. And what we see in 2nd and 3rd John is, is pretty interesting. 2nd and 3rd John are written by the Apostle John. I'll talk about a little bit more about that in a second. And uh, he's written these letters. Firstly, in 2nd John, he writes to the elect lady and her children. And then in 3 John, he's writing to a man named Gaius. We don't know who he is except for what we can figure out from the letter itself. And so there's not a lot to go on here. But what's interesting is in 2 and 3 John, both of these letters have to do with the theme of hospitality. I don't know if you probably will recognize this, but you'll see it. 2 John in verse 10, it's about the withholding of hospitality to those who are false teachers. You are not to welcome them. You are not to... Give them hospitality. And then in 3 John, it's the exact opposite. You'll see it in verse 6, where missionaries, those who are going out in the name of the Lord, laboring, um, they are to be sent out. They are to be given hospitality for their labors. And so hospitality is a major theme. In one letter, which is 2 John, it's to be withheld from false teachers. In 3 John, hospitality hospitality is to be lavished upon those who are missionaries going out in the name of the Lord. So let's go back to the author. How do we know it's the Apostle John? 
Well, there's two main reasons. One is this, that the early testimony of the church, uh, the early history of the church, um, it really shows us that early on, 2nd and 3rd John were recognized as being letters written by the Apostle John. So that's one reason. The second reason is this, is when you read like the Gospel of John and you read 1st John and you read Revelation, which um, for most people is not really an argument uh, as to who the author is in those three letters or three books. And then you start looking at 2nd and 3rd John, what you'll notice is there's a lot of similarities between the themes and the language and the vocabulary and the style in which they're written. And because of the similarities there, we could basically say, well, if it quacks like a duck, looks like a duck, walks like a duck, must be a cow, obviously. So honestly, it's more than likely the Apostle John who is the author because there are such similarities in language and themes and all that kind of stuff. I love one of the stories told by Jerome who lived in the 4th and 5th century. He was the one who translated uh, the Bible into Latin. And he tells this story about the Apostle John, how he was carried into different congregations in the arms of his disciples. And as he was carried into these congregations, he was sat down in front of the congregation and they would ask him to speak. And because he was so old, he just really couldn't stand on his own. He didn't have a lot of voice to project. And so he was only able to say this little phrase, little children love one another. Little children love one another. And his disciples began to kind of get you know annoyed or irritated by him just saying the same old thing over and over and it's like dude do you have anything else and uh, John replied to his disciples I say this because it is the Lord's command and if this only be done it is enough the apostle John is the apostle of love he was all about making sure that we obey the commands of God and love one another but he's also the apostle who was doggedly committed to the truth he was not an apostle who was overly sentimental what i mean by that is he would study his philosophy but he would also watch his hallmark movies he was not one or the other Uh, he was a man who did both so who is he writing to well we said in third john it's gaius we don't know much about him and we'll get to that in a couple weeks as we approach third john but in second john The Apostle John is writing to the elect lady and her children. And so you have three options here about who this is, the audience of this letter, the recipient of this letter. First, it could be a specific woman, uh, an unnamed woman who just has some children. Unfortunately, that is not a good fit because the pronouns that are here in the letter are plural. And so you don't usually speak to one individual in the plural unless you don't understand grammar and so that wouldn't fit so there's a second option which is it's written to a woman named clete which means chosen and the reason why you would think that is because it says to the elect lady so maybe it could be uh to the lady clete and that's her official name well that doesn't quite fit either because you look in verse 13 he closes his letter with the children of your elect sister greet you the same kind of greek phraseology And so what you would have is this, is like, hey, I'm writing to you, Lady Clete, and also your sister Clete, she says hello. Uh, We don't normally do this where we name our children the same name. Confusion may have something to do with that. And so it's highly unlikely that there would be two ladies who are in the same family who uh, have the same name. And then secondly, it would be highly unlikely for this to be Clete because we have no record of any woman in all of antiquity with the name Clete at all. And so just, I don't know, spontaneously there's these two ladies who happen to be sisters who have the same name in all of antiquity and there's, it's just highly unlikely. So then the third option is this. John is writing metaphorically to a local church and its members. He's writing metaphorically addressing the local church and its members. And I think this is the best option, and here's why. When you read throughout the Bible, you find that God is constantly referring to his people with feminine kind of images or pronouns. And so God calls his children Israel, my daughters. He calls them uh, my wife. He, you can read it in the, in the New Testament in Ephesians 5 where the Apostle Paul says the body of Christ is not just the body of Christ, but is also the bride of Christ. 
And so there's a lot of feminine pronouns, a lot of feminine metaphors, a lot of feminine imagery to depict God's relationship to his people. And so that's one good argument. And another one is this. When you read in 1 Peter, 1 Peter, who is also an apostle, he addresses his letter of 1 Peter to, in verse 1, the elect exiles. And so that same kind of elect kind of identification And then when you go to the end of his book in chapter 5, verse 13, he closes his book with this final greeting of saying, she who is at Babylon, who is likewise chosen, sends you greetings, and so does Mark, my son. Greet one another with the kiss of love. And what Peter does is in the beginning, he identifies this whole elect theme, and then he picks it up again, you likewise chosen, but he's referring to those who are in Babylon. Virtually all scholars believe that what he's referring to in Babylon is Rome. And so he's saying the church in Rome, they greet you. And so when you have a feminine kind of imagery throughout the Bible describing God's people, and you have the same kind of phraseology in the beginning and the end of Peter's letters and also in 2 John, then I think it's probably the best conclusion that we draw. He's writing to a local church and its members, the elect lady being the church in general, and then her children being those who are members of it. Now, where is he writing to? What is the cluster of churches, perhaps, or the local church he's writing to? We're not quite sure, but more than likely, it's the city of Ephesus and the uh, churches that are clustered together in that little region. And you probably understand Ephesus um, and the region of churches that are there, which are made famous in the seven churches of Revelation. You heard about that before? The very first church mentioned in the seven churches of Revelation is the church in Ephesus. And so more than likely, 2nd and 3rd John are written to, uh, 3rd John written to a particular person named Gaius, who is probably a leader in one of the churches in that region. And then the elect lady and her children are probably one, if not more, of the churches in that little cluster in Ephesus in Turkey, because that's where the apostle John spent most of his ministry life. Now, if you ever want to go to Ephesus or if you ever want to go to Turkey, modern-day Turkey, and see where the Apostle John was and ministered in the seven churches, uh, you can actually start saving your money now because Pastor Rick Moe is planning a trip in March 2021 where we're going to go to Greece and Turkey. We're going to go to Turkey to see the seven churches there from the book of Revelation, and we're also going to follow the Apostle Paul on one of his missionary journeys through Greece. So I want to let you know that that is coming up. Now, let's get to the letter itself. The elder, the Apostle John, is writing to the elect lady, which is a church, and her children. And then he begins to expand upon his relationship to this local church and its members by saying this, Whom I love in truth, and not only I, but also all who know the truth. Notice first that the Apostle John is talking about how much he loves this church. And he says, whom I love. But if you notice, he qualifies his love by saying, in truth. And it could be rendered or understood as like the Apostle John truly loves the church, just truly. But I don't think that's the best way to look at it. I think the best way to look at it is to understand that the Apostle John's love for the church is because of the fact that he is in the truth. And therefore, the truth that he is in serves as the basis for the love that he has for the church. And the reason why I say that is the next little phrase, after whom I love in the, in the truth, you can read this, and not only I, but also all who know the truth. So it's not only I who love you, John says, but it, it's also all who know the truth love you. In other words, I know the truth, and everyone else who knows the truth, we Love you. So knowing or being in the truth is the basis for a shared love. And the reason why love is shared is because truth is shared. And therefore, truth becomes the basis for love. And all who love the truth are naturally going to love the people who are in the truth. Because it is a shared truth. Now this is interesting because love and truth go hand in hand throughout the New Testament. And you're very aware of this. 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter. Every wedding you've been to probably quotes or alludes to this text in some way, shape, or form. 
Love is patient, the Apostle Paul writes. Love is kind. Love does not envy or boast. It's not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It's not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing. But love rejoices with the truth. That's an important dynamic. The Apostle Paul identifies that love has in the emotion of rejoicing. But the rejoicing in love is accompanied with the truth. Which means if you want to enjoy love, it has to be enjoyed within the bounds or confines of truth. Or as the Apostle Paul puts in Ephesians chapter 4, rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ. And so the Apostle Paul once again identifies the fact that we should be speaking truth, but the way in which we speak the truth should be characterized by love. And so if you think about it, he kind of says the same thing in two different ways. The truth needs to be spoken in love, but your love needs to be characterized by truth. And so you can never be doggedly devoted to truth at the exception of love. You can never be fully committed to love with the exception of truth. You have to have these two things together. There must be love in truth and truth in love love if you are prioritizing one above the other you're doing neither so we're not talking about a cold intellectualism when it comes to truth nor are we talking about vain sentimentality when we're talking about love what we're saying is we are loving emotionally with the truth of our minds included and so it's got to be both which naturally brings us to this question well what is the truth that john is referring to What does he mean by truth? Does he mean just simply mathematics? Does he mean simply the sky is blue? Does he mean something else? Like what what is it? What does he have in mind? Unfortunately, that would take me literally an entire series of preaching, probably at least eight to ten weeks as I charted it out, uh, to unpack truth, and so we don't have time for that. Instead, I just want to simply summarize it by reading a couple things that John writes in his gospel. John chapter 1. Verse 14, here's what he writes. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory. Glory is the only son from the father, full of grace. And what you can say is full of truth. So when Jesus, who is the eternal son of God, the word, when he becomes flesh and becomes incarnate on Christmas and lives among other people, he's living as the glorious son of God. And he is full of grace and he is full of truth. In other words, when Jesus came, ultimate truth came. Or in verse 17, for the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. And so when you jump to John chapter 14, verse 6, a verse that we well uh, know, many of us know it because it was inscribed on the bottom of the water cup at in and out which no longer is available, which is sad. But nonetheless, we know the verse, John 14, 6. Where the Apostle John records Jesus saying, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So if we ask the question, what does John have in his mind regarding truth? The answer would be Jesus and the truth that Jesus brings. Robert Yarbrough in his commentary on 2 John, here's how he summarizes it. This is higher language and I'll bring it down to those of us who (laughs) we need need the, the simpler language I had to read this about four times to figure it out, but nonetheless, here we go. Here's what he writes. John's truth is the reality of Jesus imparted through the Holy Spirit concerning the person and work of Jesus and all the ethical implications that follow in conformity to God's will as is taught in the gospel. I'll say it my way. Truth, in John's mind, is simply the gospel Christ and everything he's done, and then the gospel's implications. So it's Christ as he's taught in the gospel, who he is and what he's done, and all of the implications that flow from that, everything that we ought to do ethically speaking from that. I like how the apostle Paul put it in Colossians chapter 1 verse 3. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. 
And why is it? He says, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love that you have for all the saints, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of this you have heard before, and watch this phrase, in the word of the truth. And then he identifies it as the gospel. And so for the Apostle Paul, the word of the truth is the gospel. And so the Apostle Paul and the Apostle John both would have in their minds that the truth came with Jesus and is communicated verbally and also written about the person of Jesus and about all that he's done and also includes the ethical implications of the gospel as well. That summarizes the truth. Okay. When we go to 1 John, and for the rest of the sermon here, I'm going to focus primarily on the writings of John because I want us to get a flavor for how the Apostle John likes to say things and what he intends by them. But when we go to the opening words of 1 John, you're going to see how some of these things are put together. 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. He writes, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest, and we've seen it and testified to it, proclaimed to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you. Okay, I'm going to stop here and just simply say this. The Apostle John is going through great lengths to help us understand that he has seen, that he has heard, and he has touched Jesus. I want to make sure you understand that. I have seen, the Apostle John says, Jesus. I have touched Jesus. I have seen Jesus. Jesus is the word of life. And we proclaim to you Jesus. Why? Why is John so adamant to proclaim Jesus? Jesus and to emphasize the touching, hearing, and seeing of Jesus, well, it comes in the next two, two words in verse 3, so that you may, you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. So, the Apostle John proclaims eternal life in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, whom he has seen, whom he has heard, whom ha he has touched. This Jesus Christ, who alone has life immortal. And John is proclaiming this Jesus for the purpose of including people into their fellowship. So, you cannot have fellowship with the Apostle John in the church unless Jesus is proclaimed. To put differently, unless the gospel is preached and unless you believe the gospel, you do not have fellowship with the church or other believers, nor do you have fellowship with God the Father or God the Son. So the prerequisite for fellowship, the prerequisite for unity, the prerequisite for relationship in the church is that we believe the gospel. Fellowship cannot happen apart from that, which means mutual love for one another cannot happen apart from the gospel. The gospel has to be proclaimed. The gospel has to be believed. And once it is believed, you participate in a fellowship. And the fellowship participation means that we love one another. If there is no gospel either spoken or believed, there's no fellowship, no matter what anyone says. I know of Christians who get around and they like, hey, he's a Christian, so he says, he's a Christian, so he says, so we as individual Christians, let's get together, let's play video games, or let's watch Netflix for six hours. That is fellowship. No, it ain't. You're just getting together with people you like and doing stuff you like. Don't confuse some sort of like club experience with true Christian fellowship. Just because you like the bike ride doesn't mean bike riding equals fellowship. Fellowship is rooted in the gospel. Fellowship is rooted in the mutual love that we experience in the gospel. 
And then we read in verse 2. The very first word in verse 2 is because, which is telling us what just came before is only possible because of what is about to happen. So the only reason why we have fellowship and mutual love because of the gospel is because of the truth that abides in us and will be with us forever. Forever. Sandlot. You know what I'm talking about. And so what John is saying is, look, you need to understand that the truth, that is the gospel, all that Christ is, all that Christ has done, and all the implications that flow out of that, that truth, there is an abiding experience we have presently. And it is also something that we will have forever. Not as a potentiality, but as a reality. You have it now, and you will have it always. Now and always. And then in verse 3, John gives this kind of blessing of sorts. He says, grace and mercy and peace. And then look at the same phrase as what we saw at the end of verse 2. These things will be with us. Grace, mercy, and peace will be with us. So truth abides in us and will always be with us. And now he says, grace, mercy, and peace will be with us. So let's real quickly look at what grace, mercy, and peace are. This is real simple. The word grace starts with the letter G. The word give starts with the letter G. And so you can understand grace by understanding that it is what God gives you, though you do not deserve it. Mercy starts with the letter M. Minus is the word, starts with the letter M. Mercy is God not giving you what you do deserve. And peace is the idea that, you, that all is well because Jesus is king. And so, grace, we are receiving what we do not deserve, the love and salvation that is found in Jesus Christ. We are receiving mercy, which means we're not receiving the just punishment for our sins. And we also receive peace, which is the understanding that all is well because Christ is king. All of that will also be with us in addition to the truth of the gospel. These are huge implications, brothers and sisters. Huge. And how is all this possible? How is it possible that we will have an abiding truth, that Christ will live in us by his Holy Spirit now and forever? How is it that we will have grace and mercy and peace forever? He goes on to say, and these things are from God the Father, and from Jesus Christ, the Father's Son, in truth and love. In other words, they come from God and God's Son, Jesus. That's where they originate from. That's how they come to us. But they come to us in truth and love. Which means the fellowship we experience with one another, which is only possible by the proclamation of the gospel and believing it, where we share in the truth which serves as the foundation or the basis for our love and the mutual love we get to experience in the fellowship, all of that comes from God the Father and God the Son, and we actually have a very tangible experience of that truth and the grace and the mercy and the peace. And that same experience we have today will be with us forever. Now, I love to anchor things in the truth of God's word and in promises that Jesus has granted us. And so I want to jump to John chapter 10, verse 27, where the apostle John is going to quote Jesus and where we're going to see how we can have such confidence that these things are true. Jesus says in verse 27 of John 10, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. <laughs> what? 
Grace, mercy, and peace flow to us from God the Father and, and, and his son, Jesus. Truth abides with us forever. Yes. How do I know it'll be with us forever? Because if you have repented and believed the gospel, you are a sheep. And if you are a sheep, the Father has given you to the Son, and the Son has given you eternal life, and now you are in the Son's hand, and no one will be able to snatch you out of it. But I'll do you one better. You're also simultaneously in the hand of the Father. And since the Father is the greatest of all, no one will be able to snatch you out of his hand either. So you are in the clutches of a double-fisted God who says, this is mine. What? No one will snatch you out of the Son's hand or the Father's hand. No one. Not even yourself. Are you kidding me? So you're telling me that the abiding truth of grace and forgiveness and, and mercy and love and kindness and the strength of Jesus we just sang about and his tenderness and affections for, and all of that is mine? Yes. It's yours, undeserved by his grace. But you are in the Son's hand and you are in the Father's hand. And as Romans 8 says, if God is for you, who can be against you? What could ever separate us from the love of Christ? Nothing. I got you. You are mine and I'm yours, God says. <laughs> yes. So brothers and sisters, as a pastor, I just want you to be reassured. God is so for you. Because God is so for Jesus. And if you are in Jesus, then God is for you. We can just end right there. But there's more. Verses 4 through 7. This is where the Apostle John gets into the meat of his letter, where he's setting up the whole dreadful do not show hospitality to false teachers in verses 8 through 13, which we'll get to next week. But for now, he's setting the table for us. So look at this in verse 4. I rejoice greatly to find some of your children walking in the truth, just as we were commanded by the Father. So the Apostle John admits that he has heard somehow that within the church, whatever church it is, but in that cluster, that region in Turkey, more than likely Ephesus and the other surrounding churches, that there are some within those churches who are walking in the truth. They're walking in the truth of the gospel. Some of them are. Which means... Some of them are not. Some of them are not. In fact, there was a false teaching that was afoot within the church. And because of that false teaching, a group of so-called Christians, believing this false teaching, decided to leave the church. And what remained was those who were truly committed to the gospel. And for that, John is rejoicing. I'm rejoicing that you are still walking in the truth of the gospel. And we could presume that he is also anguished and saddened by those who have abandoned the truth of the gospel. And so he says in verse 6, and this is a, or verse 5, excuse me, this is an exhortation. This is a command. This is what he wants the church to do. He says, and now I ask you, dear lady, now I ask you, dear church, not as though I were writing you a new commandment, but the one we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. So in his joy, John then exhorts the church with this command, you need to love one another. You need to love one another. This is not a new command. This is an old one. We've had it from the beginning. We need to love one another. But I like how he begins in verse 5, and now. I think that phrase, and now, is probably an indication that what he's about to say for the rest of his letter is going to be hard to hear. What he's about to hear is going to be challenging. It's going to potentially cause division in the church. It's going to strain relationships, perhaps. And so he says, and now, in light of what's about to happen, I want you to emphasize more than ever the need to love each other. You see, in many churches, in order to maintain kind of unity and maintain peace, should there ever be a theological discussion that arises, which is significant and important, for which division ought to happen, and I'll talk more about that next week. You have two options. You can either just run to the next church 
Or you can say, you know what, let's forget all doctrine and let's forget all theology. Let's just be committed to unity at all costs. And what could happen then is you either compromise the gospel or you totally abandon it for the sake of unity. And what John is saying is, look, what I'm about to do has the potential of disrupting relationships. And it's a theological issue. You could leave like the rest of them and abandon the gospel. You can stay and try to fight for unity and peace by compromising the gospel, or you can just trust and stay true to the gospel. I'm going to always go with number three, because we learn in verse three that grace, mercy, and peace are ours in the gospel. You don't get peace by abandoning the source of peace. Jesus said, peace I give you, not as the world gives you but I give it to you. Why in the world would you abandon the true Jesus for peace? You're abandoning the source of peace. So we have to stay committed to the gospel. And John is going to make some polarizing statements. These are not necessarily calculated to win friends and influence others, but he says them. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 10 and 11, look at what the apostle John says. It's very polarizing things to say. He says, by this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoa. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. If somebody says, hey, look, evaluate your life and see whether or not you love fellow Christians. If you do not love fellow Christians, it's an indication that you are a child of the devil. Wait, what? Well, hold up. Hold up. And this is from the pen of the Apostle of love. Huh. It's a very polarizing thing to say, is it not? But you have to understand that there are great stakes here. There's a lot that is riding on the truth of the gospel. And your love of other Christians is an indicator of whether or not you actually believe the truth of the gospel. Now, we should love one another because God commands it. We've already seen it. This is the command that we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. We ought to lay down our lives for one another. We ought to love one another. And you can see it over and over again. And so John is emphasizing this command to love. But it's not just an obedience that we should pursue love with one another. That's not, only the, that's not the only motivation. There's another motivation. The very veracity, the very truth of the gospel is evidenced by our love for one another in a missional context. What I mean is people will not find the gospel attractive if we in the church who claim to be believers of the gospel do not love one another. If we claim to love one another and yet we gossip and slander and hate one another, then we preach a false gospel. And so we need to make sure that we are understanding what Jesus says in John chapter 13, verse 34 and 35. The Apostle John records this for us, that Jesus says, a new commandment I give to you, that you should love one another just as I have loved you, you are also to love one another. Now, why does he give this commandment? Jesus says, by this, by this love you have for one another as the church, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. I don't know what happened in our culture today, but we have flipped this upside down where we have begun to believe that people will believe that we are Jesus' disciples if we emphasize and prioritize the love of the world, that is, those outside the church. But Jesus actually has the exact opposite. He actually says, and Paul confirms this in Galatians 6, we should actually love primarily, not exclusively. Did you hear me say that? We do not love exclusively, but we do love primarily the brothers and sisters in our own family. For if we go to unbelievers and we say, you should be a part of us, for God is love and he loves us and he cherishes us and he meets all of our needs and we share one another love with one another in fellowship and they're like, wow, that sounds amazing. And then they come to the church and they see nothing but people like, oh, you're disgusting. And they hear slander and gossip. They're going to go, wait a minute, you told me that you have love and fellowship with God and each other and I came here and it's no different than my family. Why do I need Jesus? You see? So there's a primacy of love for the church. 
that we should make sure that we are loving one another in the church because it's the evidence of whether or not we are disciples. As John writes, by this we know love in 1 John 3, 19. By this we shall know that we are of the truth. That is, by love for one another, we shall know that we are of the truth and reassure our heart before him. For whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and he knows everything. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. If you want to have confidence that you are a disciple, the Apostle John will say, you just simply need to look at your love for one another. But if you evaluate your love for other Christians and you see that you're not very good at it, then you have every reason to doubt whether or not you are actually a disciple. But if you want your heart to be reassured and you want to have confidence before God, repent of your lovelessness, believe the truth of the gospel as the foundation for the love that you need to display to others. And so once again, we commit ourselves to Jesus and we ask him, fill us with the love that we cannot conjure up or produce in and of ourselves. And so we flee to the cross and the empty tomb. Jesus, help me love. And we will be reassured. And so obedience, love, and the joy of the gospel converge, verse six. The apostle John says, and this is love, that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment, just as you have heard from the beginning, so that we shall walk in it. So what is the commandment? He says love is walking according to the commandment. But what is the commandment? It's a good question. And we don't have to guess because we have 1 John chapter 3, verse 23, where the apostle John himself will answer his own questions. He says, and this is his commandment, twofold. Number one, that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ. And secondly, Love one another just as he commanded us. Whoever keeps his commandments abides in God and God in him. And by this we know, we know that the truth of the gospel abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. How do we know? Belief and love. If you believe in the name of Jesus Christ, God's only son, who lived the perfect life, was crucified for our sins and rose from the dead for our salvation, and because of that foundation, we are loving one another, then you can be confident and you can be rest assured you are truly a disciple of his. So continue to walk in that command. What does that mean? Continue to walk in believing the gospel. Continue to walk in loving your neighbor and also primarily loving the church. Continue to walk in these things. For as the apostle Paul wrote in Romans 13, 10, love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Love is the fulfilling of the law. And so, therefore, we should walk in it. We should walk in this commandment. How I would summarize it is simply this. This is the command that God has given us from the beginning, that we should walk in. Here it is. We should believe in Jesus as he is taught in the gospel, and we should obediently walk in the implications of the gospel, chiefly, we should love one another in accordance with the gospel. So keep repenting and believing the gospel day by day, but keep praying and loving the saints as best you know how. Because Jesus says, the world will know that you are my disciples by your love for one another. There are huge things at stake here. So why is John so adamant that the church walk in obedience to love one another? Why is he so concerned about this verse 7 he says for and the word is gar in greek which means this is the reason this is the reason why he commands these things this is the reason why he's writing about these things there are many deceivers that have gone out into the world those who do not confess the coming of jesus christ in the flesh such a one is the deceiver and the antichrist in other words the reason why i'm commanding you church to be doggedly committed to the truth and also to love. We don't want cold intellectualism. We don't want warm sentimentality. We want bold truth communicated in love, and we want love that is in accordance with the truth. We want it both. And the reason why I'm committing, I'm, I'm asking you to do this is because there's a lot of people 
who are abandoning the church, who are abandoning the truth of the gospel, and they are teaching things they ought not to teach. Namely, it says here, they are confessing, they are not confessing the coming of Christ, which means they do not believe Jesus is truly God and truly man. They deny his divinity or they deny his humanity, and therefore they deny the Trinity. And these people are deceivers and the Antichrist. Now, when we turn to 1 John chapter 2, verse 18 to 22, it answers a lot of questions for us, and I want to make sure to read this. There's a lot of people all hot and bothered about a whole host of things, but one of the things I keep hearing is about, I wonder if we're living in the last days. I wonder if we're in the last hours. I wonder who the Antichrist is. Oh, the coronavirus. Oh, man. And just a word of encouragement, brothers and sisters, um, please read your Bible more frequently than you read the news. Verse 18, children, it is the last hour. As you, and as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. All right, so let's end the discussion, okay? The Apostle John in his day said that it is the last hour, and the Antichrist has already come, many of them, in fact. All right. We good on that? <laughs> There's many more questions. Like, what about, what about? No, no, no. Verse 18. Verse 19 now. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, these people who are preaching what they ought not to preach, if they would have been of us, they would have continued with us, but they went out so that it might become plain that they, are not, they all are not of us. But you have been anointed by the Holy One. You have all knowledge. I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. There are a lot of Antichrists. Anti meaning against and Christ being the second person of the Trinity. If you are not for Jesus, you are against him. And if you are against Jesus, you are an antichrist. And how these antichrists are identified is that they denied Jesus' deity or Jesus' humanity. And therefore, they denied the Trinity. So Jehovah's Witnesses deny the true divinity of Jesus, and they are antichrists, according to John. Mormons deny the full deity of Jesus as a trinity, and therefore they're antichrists, according to John. Same with Islam. They deny Jesus being full divinity and trinity, and therefore they are antichrists. Do you see where we're going with this? Next week, I'm going to unpack it a little bit more to show how even progressive Christianity is a form of antichrist. They are in the name of Jesus, but they deny significant things about who Jesus is. And so we have to be wary of these things. You see, we live in a culture that teaches, even in churches many times, that doctrine divides. And because doctrine divides, we should never talk about doctrine. We just need to love each other. But it's so silly because, okay, don't worry about doctrine. Let's just love each other. But, but how, do you, how, do you, how do you reconcile the fact that love rejoices with truth? In other words, you can't love without truth. So if you abandon truth, don't you abandon love simultaneously? Or we only need to focus on doctrine. Doctrine is the only thing that matters. No, it doesn't. What are you talking about? We need to love. Because cold intellectualism doesn't do anything. You know, Jesus says, the world will know you are my disciples by your love for one another. Not whether or not you can parse Greek. So it has to be truth and love together, brothers and sisters. And yes, doctrine will divide. But the Apostle John says it's necessary that it does so. Because you need to be able to identify those who are truly of God and those who are not. So theology does indeed matter. Every one of us is a theologian. So that's out of the equation of whether or not you are a theologian. All of us are. But the question is not whether or not you do theology. The question is whether or not your theology that you do is bad or not. And the Apostle John would say, if you get the question, who is Jesus, wrong... It's not just you fail a test. It's that you run the risk of not being saved. Like, these are huge issues. 
And having heard all this, I know what, is ten, what, tendons, what, what tends to happen. This sermon will go on the internet. Somebody will share it. And they will write on Yelp and they'll write on Google and they'll give a review of Golden Hills and they'll say, Golden Hills is the most unloving church I've ever been to. This guy who preaches Phil Ward is a total bigot and all this kind of stuff and, and he doesn't have any love and all that. And I just, people, I wish people would be more honest and say this. It's not that Golden Hills is saying all this and it's not that Phil Ward's saying all this. The Apostle John has just said this. And so, brothers and sisters, just understand, as Jesus said, if they hated me, they're going to hate you. And so the people who say, the Apostle John, I hate what he says, I hate what he writes, they are not our enemies, but they are people who have been deceived. And so, brothers and sisters, you and I have an obligation for the love that we have received we must go and love the deceived. And how do you unblind the minds of the unbelievers? You give them the beautiful truth. Christ. So give them gospel. Give them gospel. So Father, thank you for your great love for us. God, thank you for your grace and mercy. May not a single person in our church ever feel the sense of pride and arrogance and boastfulness for having come to a knowledge of the truth. But God, may that truth humble us in the reality that we did not deserve to come to know it. But by your grace, you gave it to us. And God, as we go out and as we love one another deeply in order to authenticate the gospel we preach, God, may the words we speak with our mouths and the words we speak with our lives be congruent so that we are doggedly committed to both truth and love so that the nations would come to saving faith in Jesus. For your glory and our joy, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.